Good evening to you all. Can you hear me all right at the back? Brilliant. Lovely. Well, this evening, conserving Napoleonic military uniforms. Is it possible just for the lights to come down a bit? That would be lovely because they're right in my eyes here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Does this one go down? Does this one go down? Yes, please. That's lovely. Thank you very much. Well, it's well over two years ago that Chris phoned me up and said, would I come over to the Manx Museum and have a look at this collection of Napoleonic uniforms that needed conserving? They'd been put away in boxes for over 20 years. And that's how long it is since they were last out on display. And then before then, they'd been put on display about in the 1940s. Not in the best condition. The cases weren't airtight. Things like moths had got in. They were in an appalling state. But at the same time, these uniforms are absolutely unique and very, very special to the Manx Museum. Usually when we talk about military uniforms and things like that, we will be thinking of things like this. We see them in paintings, um, Wellington at Waterloo, or there's a few books around that actually describe Napoleonic uniforms, or you may have your little collection of tin soldiers all painted up in their uniforms. But it's so rare to actually have the originals to work from. And a lot of costume people they always want to go back to the originals when they're trying to make replicas or anything like that. And I think even sometimes, even in the film industry, you know, they try and look at some of the old ones. They don't quite get it right, but Sean Bean doesn't look too bad there as, as Captain Sharp, as you can see. But this is what the, the costumes used to look like in the museum here. These are the old um, cases, as you can see here, just laid out. Not a lot of information because we don't have a tremendous amount of information on the pieces, but they were in an appalling state. So what I'm going to look at is just these are the main pieces we're going to be looking at today. There's Captain Quillian, naval officer at Trafalgar on board the Victory. That's his uniform there. We've got Major Caesar Bacon. We're going to look at his uniform. And he was at the Battle of Waterloo. And then we've got the Royal Manx Fencibles and the Isle of Man Volunteers. We're going to start off with the Isle of Man Volunteers. These are a really interesting set of uniforms because there's pretty much, and I've been talking to Matthew about this, there's almost nothing written about them. Nobody knows how they came about. The volunteer forces on this island sort of were raised when it was necessary and then they were disbanded. And really much before the middle of the 18th century, any, any officer or any soldier or such, they didn't really have uniforms as such. So these are very, very early pieces uh, of uniform. And they're red and green, as you can see there. They're made of wool fabric. And then they've got twill wool linings on the insides of them. But for a conservator like myself, the first thing that we have to do with any item when we're going to do any conservation work is to study them really in depth to see where there are areas of weakness, where the problems are, and really work out then the best method of cleaning and stabilizing these items. Because when we conserve something, our aim is to preserve what is left of the original and make it safe for future generations to enjoy. We also do some restoration work, which you'll see later on. And the restoration work has very much involved making replica buttons for these uniforms, because every uniform had the odd button missing, and some of them had more than one missing. So we needed a, a few extras to be made. So I'm going to start off working through the uniforms. But the, for me, the most fascinating thing was actually looking at the structure. Beautifully handmade, but they're not like today's uniforms. You don't have side seams. The seams at the back are actually shaped around the scapula, so the men would have actually stood with their chests puffed out and their arms pulled back slightly. So let's look at the first one. This is the South Manx Volunteers. If I just go back one, that's this uniform here. We're going to look at this one first of all. Um, and just before I go on, you can see we've got some wonderful moth holes, plenty of moth damage on the linings. Um, and this is the, the arms. They were just 
covered in moth holes, and the moths had actually grazed their way across the surface of the fabric as well. So we've got lots of little lines where the moths have grazed around. And you can see these on the center back of the coat, more grazing and more moth holes here, another moth hole there. And then these are the little tail sections at the back. And what they did with the tail sections was we had the lining of the coat, and then they folded the lining back to form these tail sections. And then inside, we had little pockets as well at the back. This uniform had these padded epaulets on the shoulders, and these were fixed apart from this little section here that went across, and there was a buttonhole, so this could be lifted up. Inside, this is the left-hand side and this is the right-hand side, um, they were padded out with just wool fibre, which unfortunately was all coming away on this shoulder, and the fringing there was all coming away as well. But beautiful little metal spirals, as you can see there, but quite a few of the stitches from the braid, these were all broken as well. So going over the uniforms, I was making a note of all the different treatments each one was going to require. And I say, looking inside, the moths had had a wonderful time on the lining inside this coat. But the upper part of it, it would have been very warm garments for the, the, the soldiers or the men to wear because they were all made of wool. And the top fabric, this is what we call um, a wool melton. It's got a cotton warp. Um, Yes, cotton warp and a, no, cotton weft and a wool warp, get it round the right way. And it's a very, very firmly made cloth. It's heavily milled, so it doesn't felt or anything like that. Um, very, very warm felt fabric underneath. And then around the shoulders and the back here, they've actually quilted it here because there's more um, loose wool fibres inside as part of wadding um, around the top of the coat. And then this is black. Um, Melton again that's gone round the collar, lots of moth damage at the top here. And that just gives you an idea of one of the buttons. This coat actually had domed buttons. All of them had different variations on the Manx buttons, but with the legs of man, as you can see um, on it. Prior to any cleaning with the garments, if they'd got a lot of wadding, internal waddings, we worked lots of stay stitches, as you can see. This is the outside of the collar and across the shoulder area and across the upper, the upper chest. So I've worked cross stitches and stay stitches to support all these areas to make sure there'll be no damage actually during the wet cleaning itself. Excuse me, I'm just going to take my necklace off. It's making a noise. The other thing we had to do was to make sure with all the pockets that we put our hands in, pull the pockets out, and then vacuum them completely to make sure there was nothing left. And all of them had all sorts of unmentionable bits and pieces inside. Um, I don't actually know what some of it was. It was quite disgusting. So you thought, well, it's been here for 100 years, maybe. But anyway, all these bits were all vacuumed out and removed to make sure there was nothing that was going to cause any problems. And then with a lot of the, the fabric, we then went over with a special sponge that we call a dry cleaning sponge. And I've got one here, which you can all come and have a look at these later. Um, and this is a sponge that's used completely dry, and it's worked over the surface of the fabric. It doesn't raise the pile of the fabric, but it takes away any surface soiling, and it gets absorbed into the sponge. So that was done. The whole, all the garment was surface suction cleaned using a low-powered handheld vacuum and then we vacuum through a little bit of net as well like this to make sure there's nothing can get caught up from the the garment itself and then we wet clean we have a large costume sink in the studio and again I'll show you some of the the ones being wet clean later on but they were soaked for about an hour and you'll be amazed the color of the water and the smell that was coming out. Then we lifted the garments onto a flat washing surface and then using a special conservation detergent, um, which is a non-ionic detergent that doesn't have any optical brighteners, it doesn't have any perfumes in it, and it has to be used in cold water. If we used it in warm water, we wouldn't even get a sud from the detergent. So we make up this washing solution and then to clean the actual fabric, we saturate a soft sponge in the washing solution and then we press it down onto the coat and then the suction action of the sponge drawing the water and detergent through the fabric is what's used as a method of cleaning. 
So it's, it was quite amazing what was coming out of the garments with the, the wet cleaning. Yes? No, all the dyes, all the, we test all the dyes on everything first of all, and they're all natural dyes, but they were all as fast as can be, no problem at all. Once the garments were cleaned, they then had to be pressed before we then started doing all the, the repair work. Um, with the fencibles, I'm sorry, with the, the volunteers' jackets, one of the biggest problems was the green fabric that was on them. The red fabric was brilliant. That was still as the same colour as the day they'd been made. But the dyes in the green fabric had faded quite a lot, and especially when they'd been out on display here in the, in the museum. So trying to match up colours of repair fabric was a real problem. So I ended up getting some new green wool fabric, um, green wool Melton, and then using fabric paints on the top, painting on different bits so that I could match. You can see here where we've got an area that's faded here but much darker. But I've got moth holes that needed repairing. So this is the area below where I've inserted my new supporting fabric in underneath and then using very, very fine threads have worked all the repairs. The, the threads, again, I've brought some samples for you to look at. If you think of a, an ordinary silco thread, if you just want to do ordinary sewing, it's 40s in, th in thickness. We use a very fine, ultra-fine thread that's 120s in fineness. It's, it's finer than a human hair. So by using that very fine thread, it's like doing invisible repair work on the garment. This is the, the shoulder area when we're repairing. This is underneath where all the wool wadding was coming out. And there had been some nice silk fabric going underneath, which had all split. So what I've done here to actually hold all this in place, remembering we're conserving the items, we're trying to keep as much of the original as possible, is here I've actually covered it in a fine net called conservation net. And again, there's a sample of this for you to come and have a look at on the table. It's a very, very fine, it's actually a nylon net. And then we tint it to whatever color we need when we're working. And then this can be stitched in and holds everything in place. Because the underside of the epaulets at the top, these little triangular sections, they were lined in silk. And you can see here how the silk fabric was all splitting. Um, this one here has actually got the net over it. And you can just see the outline of the net there. And then I've cut it away after I stitched it, and there it is afterwards, and then made a little slit for the button to go through. So this net is put on as a, like a protective layer onto the textiles, just to hold everything in place. Jackie? Yes? Oh, it's my hair, is it? Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. I thought it was my be. How's that? Is that better? Right. I'll flick it away, out of the way. Right, coming on to the North Manx volunteer officer's jacket. Um, again, exactly the same problems with this one. Filthy, dirty. The moth holes seem to be even bigger on this one. They'd had a, a wonderful time. And it's not surprising that especially arms like this get, cut, get eaten by moth because when you're wearing your garments, anything, food or things like that, can get splashed onto the fabric. You don't realize it's there. And it's the sugar content and things like that that leaves, that's within the fabric. And that's what the moths are going for. They're not just going for the wool. They're going for a, an extra little feast of what's been left on a garment. So cuffs, again, cause problems. A lot of the metallic braids were very, very badly tarnished as well, uh, and with some of the buttons. But we used just the cleaning process as a way of actually cleaning um, the metallic parts as well. All the garments, all the back, the inside and the tails were lined in wool, but the sleeves predominantly had a fine linen fabric that had been used as a lining in them. Very, very dirty, but pretty much was, was uh, quite firm though. And this jacket had little cloth covered buttons at each of the cuffs. They were intact. And again, this time we've got the tail section at the back where we've got green lining that's been brought round. It's not quite the same um, as the previous one. And then a slightly different collar and sections at the top there. This is the inside, still with all the moth damage, as you can see. And then we've still got quilting along the top here. 
and then there's a very neat little pocket here into the tail section so he could put his hand into the pocket at the back but again this pocket had to be opened and made sure there was nothing inside before we went ahead with the wet cleaning and then the North Banks volunteers the third one again very very similar this time we've got the the white fabric pulled down we've got some other little motifs that have been added and very nice buttons but just one epaulette on the shoulder there and when you're looking closely at it we found that even the top edge of the collar the folded edge of the fabric had completely split all the way along there so that was all going to have to be repaired um, bits of the braid were lifting um, the silk fabric underneath this epaulette was quite badly damaged as well as well as all the metallic parts very very tarnished and when again when you start looking close more nasty moth holes there was a very nasty rip and tear in the cuff it's as if it had got caught on something and and ripped across so for dealing with that it's back to using our very very fine threads this is the cuff beforehand with the nasty tear and that's the fine thread and one of my needles and I very very finely darned that area all the way across um, you notice that not all my needles are straight I quite like bending my needles they, they seem to work better that way but uh, fine darning there and then here inside the collar you can see another split that oh sorry the low sorry this is the lower part of the cuff another split there that needed repairing um, and it's the same with all the uniforms unfortunately what you see on the outside it's amazing what's gone on inside them because again I wanted to make sure that they were well stabilized because I don't think they'll be coming off display another 20 years so they're going to have to last plenty of time the other big problem we found um, with the, a lot of the uniforms were that the buttons had been moved at different times because again with these uniforms they are so rare and there's only a few of them that people would have carried on wearing them they, as they got bigger in size or what have you the buttons got moved in position but what was interesting was the original buttons were all stitched in linen thread so I knew exactly which were the original stitches and which were the more recent ones so these are the original positions of these buttons so after we'd cleaned it all cleaned the buttons we actually put the buttons back into their original positions we wanted to recreate how the uniforms had originally been so coming on to the Manx fencibles now fencibles they were raised again on the island. They were only raised when necessary um, as, as, a, as a military force. We've got a painting here. This is on display in the gallery of Captain John Christian. And it gives you an idea of what the uniform would have been like. They would have had some sort of frilled shirt underneath. And as well as the jacket, they all came with, sometimes with waistcoats and breeches and everything like that. But the reason why these are so rare here in the island is that we just don't have the rest of the uniform and it's often thought that these uniforms because they were only used for a short period of time afterwards they could have been used for anything they could have been used for fancy dress um, somebody even said to me once they thought they'd seen one as a scarecrow a scarecrow in a field but often buttons and things would be removed off them so it's so rare to actually have um, one of these in the museum itself so this is the Royal Manx Fencibles officer's jacket. Um, I understand that this one had been bought in an auction, but it suffered all the same problems as all the other garments with a lot of moth damage here, as you can see on the front. This is this section here. The cuffs were in a very, very poor state. A lot of the wall lining was actually coming away. Plenty of moth holes was gained in this section here. And the top of the collar, the, the section here, it was lined in silk velvet. It would have been really lovely and soft around one's neck. But the moths have chewed their way along the top here, and there was a nasty split all the way along the top. The buttons were a really unusual configuration on it because they should be all large size buttons here. Then we went on to lots of little tiny ones. So the bigger ones had actually been removed, and smaller ones had been put in, in place. And they're rather lovely, these Manx fencible buttons, again, with the Isle of Man, as you can see um, in the middle. This is the inside, the usual tail, more and more moth damage. And then this is the centre back of the fencible jacket. We've got a button missing here, and again, these weren't originals. 
Um, there's just four little ones here where there should have been large buttons on this section, another button here. And little emblems at the bottom here, these have been put on at a later stage. If I come to the next picture, you can see more clearly here the discoloration on the coat. So this wasn't an original, but that's what's there today. And we could tell a lot of the problems with the buttons because when you find the thread that's not the original and then you've got an imprint on the coat, especially with these ones, these little ones here, we've got the original imprint there. So I was able to see exactly what size button had been there previously. And uh, these little pockets, they lifted up went deep down into the tails and underneath there was a little flap again with another button for fastening the pockets. As I opened up the front of the coat, undid the buttons, we had all the filth and the usual moth remains and everything down there. So again, it's back to cleaning. And this is using the dry cleaning sponge to get as much of the, the dust and the dirt and the surface filth off the fabric before we went ahead with the next stage of wet cleaning. Um, it will all be vacuumed as well afterwards. As I say, the sponge absorbs the dirt and then it leaves lots of little gritty bits that need to be removed. But these are the two fensible jackets. Um, sorry, not uh, Royal Manx, yes, Royal Manx fensibles. They're, we had two in to deal with. They, that's my costume sink at the back there. They've been soaking, they've been fully wet cleaned. And after they've gone through their final rinse in the purest water possible, which is deionized water, they're then laid out to dry. And they're well padded with towels, as you can see there, all the way around to actually help recreate the shape. Um, this one gives you a little bit more of an idea where I've even used towels to go around the neckline there to help bring it all back um, as part of the drying process. And then each arm is all padded out. Um, I was a bit old fashioned when I had my children and I had um, toweling nappies um, and I'm still using them as part of my way of actually padding out the clothes. They're just the right size. But this is some of the repair work now on the, the Royal Manx Fencibles. You can see this is what the, the collar was like beforehand, badly damaged. So selecting the new fabric to go behind, I've actually added a whole complete new piece inside the collar, stitched it down, and then cut it to the correct shape. Um, the lining inside this silk velvet, I've backed it with a silk fabric. And then you can see my curved needle here, but it's quite difficult to see but there's lines of stitching that go all the way down here. These are laid couching threads where I lay a thread over and then come back and stitch back and it holds everything closely together. And then this is just making where there's moth holes is actually getting the right color fabric, inserting it in under the hole using fine tweezers. And then again with my nice bent straight needle stitching um, back. With all the fabric, all the red fabric, I use very, very fine red silk thread. And again, you can come and have a look at the fineness of that thread because I just didn't want any of the stitches to be able to be seen on the garments. With the selection of the fabrics, I took quite a while contacting different uh, manufacturers of wool fabrics. And again, I've got all the samples for here for you to see. But I found out very quickly that the wool melting cloth or broadcloth as well, it's sometimes known as, the manufacturers today are the same manufacturers that were making the same cloth back at the time of Trafalgar. So most probably I have bought cloth from the same manufacturer who first made one of the naval uniforms or some of these military ones. And when you go through the names of the cloths, you know, it's Royal Navy Blue, you know, or Scarlet for the red, like the scarlet in the jacket. So really quite interesting. And therefore, the color match was perfect, which was brilliant, apart from the green. So I didn't have to do any dyeing or tinting of those fabrics. So this is mending, um, again, the Manx Fencibles jacket. Once These are all the buttons that have been incorrectly positioned, and the originals had been taken off, so I could see there was quite a lot of problems here. So the, only the bottom one and the, uh, and the one at the top were originals still stitched on with their original linen thread. So I knew this was going to be quite a major undertaking to sort this bit out, which you'll see later on. Um, this is where the lining had all come away, and I found the original fastenings for the jacket because they were only fastened at the top so that the tail section fell away. So 
again with the fastenings, they had linen tape inside to which the fastenings had all been attached. So I managed to find the two little bits of linen tape and then have some, find some old hooks. I'm a great collector of old bits and pieces, so I found some old hooks that matched and put those. And then that's the front afterwards when it's had all the new blue fabric put behind and all the moth damage has been repaired. Well, this is the second of the, the fencible um, jacket. This one, again, had been altered many times. The front had all sorts of weird alterations to it. The buttons were not original. They'd been moved, but we can't deal with all of that. Um, lots of moth damage, as you can see there. And the cuffs were in extremely poor condition with this jacket. And again, round the armholes inside, a lot of nasty splits. They've lost the little motifs that would have been stitched at the back there. Um, they're no, no longer. But the cuffs here were particularly bad. There was a lot of previous repair work um, with this uniform. You can see some rather wonderful um, stitching that has gone on there. Um, and this part of the cuff had been completely ripped away. Um, the buttons for fastening were missing, but I've got, can you see I've got a little mark there? And, and that's the, on the other side. They had completely gone. But like the, the volunteers' jackets, what we decided to do was to actually make cloth buttons for the upper button on the jacket here. So with my red wool fabric, an uh, acid-free mounting card, cut out a disc, wad it with a little bit of cotton wool, and then make a button with a long thread. And then that gets stitched into position. And there it is afterwards. So making the button exactly the same way as the originals have been made um, by looking at the other uniforms. And again, this collar was in a poor state. This is where the original buttons had been. They were, there was only one missing there, um, one remaining. But this collar needed lining with new blue fabric. That edge needed a cutout section put in to infill all around there. And then again, red fabric put in to the inside lining. And then I found that there was the original top stitching thread that had been worked. So I've started copying that just along that edge there and then finished stitching all the way around to hold the fabrics in place. You can just see a little bit of the top stitching there. So it's always trying to copy what has been worked originally. And with this piece, because my support went inside, I even stitched through the original needle holes that had been there in the lining to try and keep everything as near as possible to the original. And there he is afterwards, once he's looking a bit tidier. He's not on display in the gallery, but he's there as, as a change around in years to come. So he's, he's in the um, store at the moment. And when I'd finished him, I actually put two buttons on the back of his tail there because he hadn't got any emblems to be in place. Come on to Sir Mark Cubbon, very important person here. He, he had a, an illustrious career out in India. And as you see, there's a statue of him out in Bangalore. But his uniform is quite incredible. Um, again, you'll see this on, in the gallery. Um, very, very fine uh, red broadcloth here. Much finer in texture than the one on the um, previous items I've been showing you. Some nasty staining, though, on the tails, very long tails of his coat. and. But the incredible thing was the gold work here, and the gold work on his collar was absolutely exceptional, and on the back of his coat here. Um, one of the discs here, one of the motifs was missing. The part of his tail was very badly damaged, and also the cuff off his left arm was missing as well. All that beautiful gold work had disappeared. So this is a detail of the, the gold work. This would have been so expensive to have been made, even at the time. Um, and it takes a very, very skilled person to do gold work, padded gold work like this. But, as always, the moth has been along and had a chew, found something nice to have a go at. And that gives you an even more close-up detail of this amount of gold work. We've got what's called flat plate that's worked. This is actually stitched as a zigzag that goes across. We've got the fine coils. We've got spangles, more little fine coils across the top here. Just exquisite. Um, but 
in a poor state. Filthy, filthy, dirty, so it needed cleaning, and so did these wonderful epaulets on the top. These were very, very heavy um, with all the metal thread that went around the coils at the bottom there, and quite solid, solidly made, as you can see there. And the epaulets are attached onto the coat with little strings that come through, almost like boot laces, and they come through holes that are actually made within the garment, so they have to be tied on underneath. But you can see here how filthy, dirty the neckline of his coat was. Lots and lots of splits in the silk lining inside as well. But again, it had all been quilted, the stitching forming, the quilting, so it was a very warm coat for him to wear. This gives you some idea again of the problems. This is the, the left-hand side of the tail section where that emblem had been removed, but all the stitching had been broken and was coming apart. But it, there was always a tension to detail where they put a binding up the folded edge of the tail where the lining came across just to work as an extra support and give you a really nice um, firm line. But lots of wear again and moth damage on the back of the coat and tarnishing. And this is again on the tail with a, I don't know what this cross was made of, but a very, very nasty bit of something that was on it. But it all came away with a dry cleaning sponge. It was brilliant. It all came off. And there was lots of previous repairs all along the inside of the lining here. Some rather coarse darns. And a lot of these were causing more damage to the silk lining as well. So these were all unpicked and removed. They weren't original. They were unpicked. And then we did repair work later on. But the coat was wet cleaned, sponged all over the fabric, but for cleaning the metal work, this side's been cleaned, this side hasn't been. I've used a very, very soft gentleman shaving brush, which is just the natural um, bristles, uh, badger hair bristles, gently working over, and you can see how the gold was coming through beautifully on that. So that was all that was done as a method of cleaning. Once it was cleaned, then there was all the repair work to be done. And here I'm using a mixture of curved needles. There's a curved needle there. And straight needles going through the, the coiled threads, stitching down the loose sequins. And this one was actually stitching down some of the loose threads that went over this area of the moth hole. So very, very fiddly to do. Um, I did as best I possibly could on this piece because it really was very, very difficult to do the repair work because I couldn't actually push my needle through the fabric because there was all the interlinings and everything there and I didn't want to remove those. So a curved needle was really the best thing for some areas, but I say very fiddly. But there he is once he's all cleaned and repaired, as you'll see him in the exhibition. And our other very important man, of course, is Captain John Quillian and say that he was on board the Victory, um, and we have his naval uniform. Just a little bit of information there, you can have a quick read through, but you know, there were, as I say, 65 Manx men were actually known to have fought at Trafalgar, so he's one of a, a few, but what we're so special is that we have his full naval uniform. But this uniform had been played around with many times, especially the lining. The linings that were on display, none of them were original at all. Um, these are pieces, odd patches of silk that had been put in at different times. And then this is a cotton lining that was very, very badly stained, which I'll show you the inside of in a moment. This is the reverse side of his coat. Um, where these buttons are, are very deep pockets. And the pockets came right the way down inside, so you, know, you could really get your hand right down in the back of the... Um, the jacket, you can just see, and there were side pockets, that's a side pocket there, and then there were more pockets up here as well, and of course, epaulets across the top. There were quite a lot of repair work had been done, and um, these are some little patches that have been put in around the arms, there have been repairs, and down the sleeves, there have been some very, very coarse stitches worked. One of the cuffs had got a very nasty rip in it, and somebody put a few stitches in it there. There was little bits of the braid were coming away. And again, these are some of the, the odd bits of silk that have been put into the lining. This is the back of the coat, which then became really one of the most interesting parts of the whole garment because it's got these two nasty stains here. 
These were blood stains on the back of the coat. The blood stains are on cotton lining, but I say this lining, which has been stitched around here, comes around here, stitched across the top and down the sides, was not the original lining, because at the sides, I'll show you in a moment, I could see little bits of silk. So I knew there was a, should have been a silk lining to this coat. So this had been added, but the blood, had, but where did these blood stains come from? Because on the outside of the coat, at this area and here, there were little tiny holes in the fabric. So when Quillian had been wearing this, something had burnt through or something sharp had come through and had pierced his skin, but there was no hole on this lining at all. So it didn't, the two didn't put, really come together properly. So when the coat had been realigned, it must have been used, but of course it would have got wet and with getting wet, the blood that was in the coat itself has seeped into the new cotton lining. In there, that's the only way I can see how it would have come about. Because I'll come on to a bit more of the lining in a moment, but these are the breeches that, that he had. Extremely dirty. Um, they had a lot of, of holes on them, mainly, unfortunately, around the crutch area, which was not particularly nice around here. Um, this is the back, which was really quite big and baggy. And the reason why his trousers were so baggy at the back is that they wore these wonderful shirts. So he needed somewhere to shove his shirt into his trousers. So very much packed around the back to keep a very flat front. Um, and then there were ties at the back here to let the back in and out. And what's called a full front that drops down with buttons. Um, and then there were the buttons on the, the, around the calf as well. Um, this little bit hung down and there was a button missing, so I actually put a little cloth button underneath the fabric at the back for that piece. But this is coming back to the, the blood part again. During the wet cleaning, we put stay stitching all around this area, and this is the outside of the coat where you can see the little snick in the fabric itself. Um, during the cleaning process, wet cleaning, and then cleaning all the metal braids as well using the shaving brush. Uh, and it was amazing how the dirt was coming off. This is the front of the coat where you can see this side's being cleaned. This side is yet to be cleaned. So we're getting quite a lot of difference with the metal threads, metal braids as well. But with the blood stain, this is quite a close up, but during the cleaning, it did slightly split, the fabric split around the top. So I lifted up the little bit and there's the original silk lining of the coat underneath. And that was stained as well with the blood. So, but I didn't want to get rid of this piece. And because it is slightly split, this shiny bit of fabric you can see there, this is called um, silk crepeline, which I put a special conservation adhesive into. And that was inserted in underneath that part and then heat sealed into position to hold everything together. So it's still all there. But I started taking off those patches of lining off the bottom and there was all the original there inside and then looking up inside I could see all the original silk was there. Um, this one we've got the part of the pocket um, from the trousers and then this is what's left of the original silk. It was in an appalling condition, badly split but I've left it all in place and then chose some new silk lining of the same twill as the original and then relined just the lower part of the coat with that fabric because I still wanted those blood stains to still be visible higher up. So the lower part has actually now been relined um, and looks a lot more respectable. But the top part of the coat had a few problems. The fastening hooks um, were really badly damaged. This is the quilted part of the inside of the collar and this is the cotton lining that's coming away there. This had all been lined in silk as well. And you can just see some little time, this is the edge of the collar, there's just some little bits of silk that were left. So what I did with the collar, this is looking at the collar now down. The collar had been interlined with red wool flannel. It also had a buckram interlining in it. This is the outer blue fabric and this is the actual fold back of the lapel on the front. But where the silk here was quilted, um, onto the collar. I actually put a new piece of matching silk. This is my inside now. It's pinned into place, but I reline the inside of the collar with new silk 
Um, so it would all look much smarter around the top and then stitched it all back together again. So there he is, once he's all cleaned and on display. So this is why I put new silk around the collar because I knew you'd just see the little top bit there and then he's got the new silk on the lining of his coat just on the lower section. And his breeches, they all needed lining inside with cream wool fabric and I've got the fabric here you can see that we used to stitch together. We've got his hat, that was in an appalling state as well, filthy dirty, slitting as you can see there. I know time's racing on so I'll fasten up a little bit but that was all hand solvent cleaned and this is by hand solvent cleaned using a little tiny cocktail stick with a little dob of cotton wool on the end with solvent and then working my way over the fabric. And you can see that section's being cleaned and that one was waiting to be cleaned. Once it all been done, then all the braid needed to be restitched back into place using a fine curved needle again and then making a support for it to go on top. And then perhaps the star of all the uniforms is Caesar Bacon. This, as we say, is one of the only complete uniforms that's known that was worn at Waterloo. And it's wonderful. I hope some of you have seen it already in the gallery. Um, this is his jacket, the top part of his uniform, which really wasn't in too bad a condition. Apart from it being very dirty, it had got a few moth holes in various places. Um, these buttons were not original, but it was, it was dirty. Um, the epaulets, again, silver epaulets here, lined in, in cream silk. The silk was all splitting and the waddings were coming out. But the whole uniform was embroidered with silver around the collar and around the cuffs as well. And on the center back, the silver tassels here that hang down with two little bits that stick up that hold his belt in position. And then there were little hooks at the cuffs. And then just above was a little silver button as well. So the epaulets really were in a poor state. So these are being solvent cleaned. This is it being immersed in solvent. Then they're left to dry. And then it was a matter of dealing with all the inside parts. Um, the other important thing was why we dry clean them was inside they've got metal sections that come down to help keep them very, very stiff on the uniform. So here I've used cream silk fabric and I've relined the inside left all the original there, but then just put new cream silk over the top and then washed all the original ties, because you can see they're all looking dirty, and then stitched those back into place. And then on the right-hand side, there they are finished, ready for reattaching onto the jacket. These are the trousers that went with the uniform. Again, lots of moth holes and damage, very, very dirty. But he also, we also had his day hat, this had a few problems with part of the, the brim coming away here, very, very soiled inside. This was completely immersed in solvent and hand solvent cleaned. Um, we've got a paper label inside, so again, paper fortunately is fine in solvent. And then starting to actually clean all the metallic parts as well afterwards to bring the silver sheen back to those. And that's the inside of his belt. You'll see his belt well on display, but this is the inside where it was all done up with leather straps and previously people had used um, some brass um, tags that you push through and bend the backs on. I can't remember their name for the moment, but these have been pushed into the fabric as well, so they were all taken off because they weren't original. But these are the trousers, um, very, very dirty on the inside of the legs. Again, lots of nasty moth holes and what have you. And then during the wet cleaning, that's the colour of the, the wet cleaning of the, the water um, during his soaking treatment. And it's not just the colour of the water, it's the smell that comes out as well. You can't quite describe that. But, um, but there he is now, back on display um, with his hat, everything all put back together again. But what you'll notice is here, he's got different buttons, but I'll come on to the button section in a moment. But the hat all cleaned up. Um, all the silver braid cleaned up beautifully. But his other hat is his shako, um, or shako, however you want to call it. This was in the most appalling condition. Um, 
I don't think I'd had something really quite as bad as this for a long, long time. It had been played around with a tremendous amount. This is the, the feather that sits down the front, and then we've got the Waterloo emblem on the front, and then silvered um, sections. They, these could be taken down and tied under the chin to keep it in place, or tied across the front on the actual um, shako itself. If I just come to the next one, this gives you a few more ideas. The top of it had got some nasty splits, something had been pushed down on it. The whole of the inside had been lacquered with different adhesives. It was revolting. Um, this is the silver parts at the sides. And then here, there's where there have been lots of moth, areas of moth damage, different adhesives have been used, different things have been stuck inside. And all I can say, it had been extremely badly abused. And the neck flap at the back here, which was attached to the, the silver bits that go around the sides, that was actually detached from the, the shako as well. So this is the actual cleaning of it. When I started work, I wanted to try and sort out all the moth damaged areas and then realize that somebody in the past had actually stuffed paper up inside and then painted this paper to make it look like the shako and it just started cut those it was copious amounts of this started coming out it was as if somebody had gone into the toilets and just got out the paper towels and shoved them up inside and put paint on top it was really horrible. Um, lots of different adhesives have been used to hold the emblem down. Um, this had to be lifted up because the actual plume that went down inside was actually stuck. These were meant to be detachable so they could be taken out. So, but I couldn't clean it because it was stuck underneath the emblem and you can see all the different types of, of horrible adhesive that were there. So I won't go into all the, the program, but using different solvents and things to get rid of the adhesives and all the, the other problems. Um, this is the neck flap at the back which was detached um, from the hat, um, from the shako. Lots of moth cocoons on the velvet lining underneath these sections but you can just see on the right hand side there where I've cleaned one and the other one was waiting to be cleaned so things started to really start coming together this all the leather here had to be treated lubricated and treated as well because um, it's got a little bit of what we call red rot so that all needed to be stabilized as well to stop it from disintegrating basically the surface of it but the thing was the big thing was to get this beautiful plume back to how it should have been. So it's using little tiny cotton wool buds again, deionized water, conservation detergent, and then just rolling my little buds with absorbent paper underneath, good old kitchen roll, anything like that's good to go through and absorb up. You can see the amount of dirt that was coming off. It looked a little bit like a shaggy dog once I'd finished it all there. But it's amazing what a, a hairdryer, just on a cool air will do, fluffing up all the feathers and there it is afterwards, and that's the shako on the right-hand side once it had been co completed. Um, we put new wool fabric in underneath all the moth-damaged areas, cleaned all the silver up, and then put everything back together again and restitched the, the um, section round the neck. That, to apply that onto the helmet, I actually, or the shako, I actually put some new fabric around the edge and then inserted that up inside as a way of holding it all into place. So quite a fiddly job to do, but it got it back in. But Bacon also had his sabre attach. This is a cavalry man's dispatch bag. Um, again, matching his uniform, you'd lift up the flap at the back and there's a nice couple of pockets to put all your messages in. And then this had straps that came up and went around his waist. And a, in addition to this were two hooks onto which his sword was attached as well. Um, the sword will appear eventually on display. They're still making the support for that. But again, quite badly soiled. All the, the metal parts were discoloured. There was quite a lot of damage again to the embroidery. And the moths had had a wonderful time chewing into the wool fabric that went around the edge here. So lots of repair work or lots of cleaning cleaning all the metal work and all the way around the edge, then inserting matching wool fabric into this section. Once I'd inserted my pieces in, I then went along with a curved needle 
and stitch all around the edge to hold that in. And that's the shaker, um, sorry, not the shaker, the dispatch bag on the right hand side once it had been completed. We had the cartridge case also that belonged to um, Caesar Bacon. His outfit must have cost an absolute fortune. Um, and you, you think he's on the battlefield at Waterloo, and there he is, dressed with all this silver and everything. He must have been saying, look at me, you know, fire at me. You know, I'm, I'm really standing out. He was injured twice, I believe. But it was really nice on his, on his cartridge case. Um, it was very badly tarnished. We've cleaned that, used the dry cleaning sponge to clean all the leather part of it underneath and again with the maker's name. But I found the, the original silver marks or the hall marks on it there and on the side there for 1822, so of William Trainers. So we knew that that's when it was hallmarked. And then the last of all the uniforms to show you, this is a little bit later, but this again is uh, the 1890s. Slightly different style in shape. You can see a later uniform where we have armholes. We don't have the seams cut in quite the same way. A totally different style of uniform, but it still had all the same problems of being dirty, needed a lot of cleaning and metal cleaning on it as well. And these are the trousers that go with the outfit. Um, you can see here, very, very badly marked, but it was surprising, a good, good soak and a good clean. We got rid of all the nasty stains and everything off. There were two buttons that were incorrect on the trousers. And again, I went back through one of my old button boxes and the one that actually belonged to my grandmother, I found two matching buttons that have gone onto there. So we didn't have to worry too much with those. And then a lot of the cleaning with this uniform was done with a dry cleaning sponge because we had a, a paper label inside. So I couldn't do any wet cleaning or anything like that. That would damage paper label but I wanted to keep it safe so cleaned this one with a dry cleaning sponge and then vacuuming and there he is on display. But the one thing with all the uniforms is that you've noticed once they're on display their mannequins fit exact and that was one of the other things that we wanted to do with this set of uniforms was to have bespoke mannequins made. So it was off to London, they all went down to London with me to a bespoke mannequin maker and what we did with all the uniforms before we went to the mannequin chap, we washed everything just in case there was any chance of any shrinkage. I wanted to make sure we had the right sizes. And then it was selecting the right style of mannequin for each uniform. And the, the mannequin supplier I chose had worked a lot with Napoleonic and period uniforms before. So they had the right style of mannequin. They knew the shoulders would have to come back. And it's amazing, we took, it's like having a, for a woman, a, a fitting for a wedding dress. These uniforms had three fittings for their mannequins. So this is the first one, trying to get an idea of the shape. And you can see we've got the shape of the mannequins are quite long, just to getting an idea, because what we wanted to create was what's known as cutaway mannequins, because we wanted to support the tails, but we didn't want to have the rest of the mannequin there. We didn't want to have all this section. We wanted people to be able to see there were tails at the back. So it meant once they were onto their mannequins and we'd sorted out which body was going with which, it's then drawing carefully all the lines because this section was then going to be cut away. And here I am holding this bit while they're very carefully drawing along the bottom of the mannequin there. So we brought all the uniforms away. The mannequins were cut and made up. And then the uniforms actually went back down to London again. You didn't know all this bit, did you, Rich? <laughs> They'd been travelling around the UK um, for their fitting, just to make sure that they then fitted. And then for the third fitting, the mannequins and some of them, the people came up to the studio to do the final fitting because you can see here where they've all been cut away. And then once that had been done, it's choosing the colour that they're going to be painted. So there are lots of different colours. There were supports that were needed to be made for the hats as well to fit inside because each of the hats, the shako and what have you, they all had to be measured inside to make sure that they had the right size support made. And then came the fun and games when all the uniforms were going back on to their mannequins. It had all been repaired. We had all the problems of the missing buttons. 
I removed just one of the original buttons where I had to, to find out, you know, to really to send, be able to make my replica ones. And it was really lovely. We actually got the maker's name who made the buttons originally. Um, this one, Nutting, um, they were in Covent Garden. They were only making buttons between 1800 and 1840. So we knew that that was the period that these buttons and also the ones at the end there were similar. But all of them were just very, very slightly different. But with Caesar Bacon's uniform that was worn at Waterloo, all the round flat buttons down the front were not originals. And when I took them off, I found the maker's mark underneath there. And they were only made in 1910. So no way were they the original buttons for a Waterloo uniform. But there were two little silver buttons on the cuffs. And they had the Sphinx and the Light Dragoons and Waterloo on them. So I actually removed one of those buttons and then used that as my mold for making new. And that's the little button. That's the, my replica one that I've made. But making replica buttons is a real fiddle. You start off with your silicon that's part of the mold that you're going to make your molds out of. And into that, I've worked corn flour and baby oil. <laughs> Mixing it together, the smell is really quite horrendous. You have to work in a well-ventilated area, so it's mixing it all together. And then in a mould, I place all my, my silicon in and then take the original button and then push it down to it's just level across the top of the mould. And then that was left for about two to three hours to make sure the silicon had completely set and then the button could be taken out. Once it was taken out, I was left with a mold. You can have a look at these like this with the button in with the, the design inside. Then making up a special resin with a, a thickener in it and also metallic elements that are put into the resin. This was then poured into each of the molds because the molds were for the different shapes of all the different buttons. And then I put a little tiny shank across the top and just rested that on the top of the, of, the, of the resin and then had to put a cocktail stick so it didn't sink down into the button because I needed that to be able to attach the button onto the garment. And then these were then left for 24 hours to dry. The problem with the, the bacon uniform, because I only had one button off the cuff, I needed 18 buttons. So once I'd made my first mold, I then had to make another one and another one, and so it went on um, till I had enough buttons. And in total, they're all the buttons that I needed to make for the, the actual um, fencibles and the um, volunteers' coats. But I say there were 18 of the little um, ones for the, the Waterloo outfit. But what I did with them, th this, these had a, a brass... Uh, metallic element added to the mold which you could then buff up but it didn't bring it up shiny enough to how I wanted so some of the buttons then had to be painted and with different metallic paints to make them blend in as near as possible and then with one of the garments the buttons were so shiny this one's actually got gold leaf put on it because a lot of the buttons did have gold leaf before on them um, the ones for the Waterloo, I was able to put some aluminium filings in with the, the resin. And then that's what it looks like when it comes up. And then when you buff it up, then you get a sheen onto the buttons. So it brings them up. But I'm sure, as you can imagine, it took quite a lot to make all those buttons for the uniforms. And these are the ones that went on the Waterloo ones. So these are the flat ones that were taken off. And these are my replicas that I've now made, as I say, saying Waterloo 23rd Light Dragoons underneath with the little shank. And then they're all stitched on. So they match the original one that's just on each of the, the cuffs there. But we stitched our buttons in exactly the right same positions as where the originals have been. So again, we'll get the right fold back on the uniform. And then comes the time of actually bringing everything back to the museum. Um, trying to work everything and coming just at the right time when the museum were ready for us because while I was doing all of this, they were busy remaking the whole gallery, rebuilding it with all the new displays and arranging all the other items. So my husband and I brought over all the, all the 
the uh, mannequins. Um, they, they, well, the mannequins arrived and we brought a few other bits with us. So we unpacked the box and there was all these legs and bodies all over the place. So it's a matter of trying to work out which one went with which. And you can see that it's quite exacting putting the mannequins, mannequins together. They've all got screws and everything inside. And this is for, for Bacon's uh, trousers. You can see they fitted absolutely exact. Um, I know it's a bit of a funny picture here. I've got a needle in my mouth because I'm trying to attach the um, epaulets onto the uniform once it was all in place. And the arms all just hook into place there. Any of the uniforms that needed trousers, um, because mannequins don't have quite the same sort of waist as such, we've got buttons, so we've actually made um, strips almost like braces to go across to make sure the trousers are not going to fall down. Um, but with Captain Quillian, we then, his legs had been made to exactly the right size so that we could actually do up the bottom of the trousers with the little button, and then his legs are just hanging free. But this is an interesting um, mannequin because he got tr legs as well. We had to have this funny shape bit that comes up the back and then goes into the mannequin as well because you can't have anything going through the garments so the mannequin had to be shaped that the support could go in that way. So a lot of care and attention is needed to get them right and there he is actually being put onto his mannequin so you can now see why the stand comes up, goes up the back and then comes in behind the back of his trousers. Putting the Manx fencible, um, yeah, Royal Manx fencibles jacket together. This is the one where the only two original buttons are the two at the top and the two at the bottom. All of these are replicas now that all the way go down the front. So when you have a look, you'll be able to see it's just a slightly different in colour, but it still is a mould taken from one of the originals um, to actually create the correct shape. And then on the back, where there were little tiny ones before, we've now got larger buttons. And the little ones that were there were then put onto other uniforms where there were buttons missing. So there was a complete mix and match, you know, moving buttons around to get them into their right positions. And there we've got um, some Mark Coven when he was finished. Where his right hand arm or the metallic embroidery being ripped off, I just gave him a new navy blue cuff. Um, I wasn't going to start embroidering a missing cuff, so he just got some fabric there, but you don't see that one because it's folded behind him. And there are all the, the volunteers and the Royal Manx Fencibles in their display cabinet. And there's, as I say, the one on the right-hand side is not on display, and also this volunteer's one isn't on display as well, but he will be eventually one day. And you can now see quite clearly the cutouts at the back to support the backs of the tails, but without having the rest of the mannequin standing out. So I hope you'll enjoy going up into the gallery and having a look, and this evening's talk has given you a little bit more of an insight into what a conservator does to try and get some uniforms ready for an exhibition. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>